Hello there, my fellow snarky undead robotic Egyptians, and welcome back to a series which has kind of fallen into obscurity on the channel. The series is obviously the Necrons, but the topic is going to be something new. It's also going to be the first video I make on the Necrons dedicated to just one character. The Traz in the Infinite video doesn't really count as that was Warhammer humor. So, today's main guy is none other than Anrakir the Traveler. I am sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, but to me Anrakir does sound a bit more Egyptian than Anrakir. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Anrakir, also known as the Traveler, is a nomadic Necron overlord, wandering from tomb world to tomb world across the galaxy, aiding the Necron cause whenever and however he can. Not many Necrons awaken from their stasis sleep with a fully functioning consciousness. Many of them arise addled by their long slumber, their wits and reason slow to come fully online. But this was not the case for Anrakir. He arose from dormancy during the Necron's great sleep with his mind fully intact, and a great purpose foremost in his mind to unite the Necron dynasties. Embracing that as his destiny, Anrakir the Traveler, as he came to be known among his kind, abdicated all responsibilities to his own tomb world of Pyria before leading an army into the stars. His self-appointed job was to rebuild the united Necron realm, and that job continues to this day. While his plan may have been glorious, the galaxy had changed a lot since Anrakir last walked upon its worlds, and the maps of old no longer corresponded with the reality of the present. Planets had been destroyed, planets had been isolated by warp storms, or even shifted through time and space itself. Even should the world remain in the position recorded of it, the stasis tomb beneath the surface might well be gone, destroyed by tectonic upheaval, meteor strikes, or rather unforeseen disaster. Worst of all, however, was for Anrakir to arrive upon a sleeping tomb world and discover it infested with lesser life forms. Anrakir had little desire to start war for its own sake, his forces were too meager for wanton hostility. But to arrive on a slumbering tomb world and discover its catacombs collapsed and its resources plundered was enough to drive him into a rage, a rage that obviously boded ill for any perpetrator. Be the invaders a low-technology human colony, a sprawling wow of orcs, a Tau expedition force, or the industries of the Adeptus Mechanicus, only one response was possible. Swift and absolute war. Often fighting alongside the Tomb World's own forces, if any were left, or battling to avenge them if they were not. Of course, not all the Tomb Worlds Andrakir arrived upon were in such dire throes. Some had gone entirely unnoticed by the galaxy at large. But in a universe burgeoning with inquisitive life, these planets were few and far between. From each tomb world awoken or freed from invaders, Anrakir requested a tithe of warriors and weapons to be given over to the cause. If the supplication was refused, he would seize the prize via force or artifice instead. A newly awakened tomb world is inevitably a confused and disordered place, and these acquisitions were easily engineered. This also goes some way to explain Andrakir's muddled reputation among the tomb worlds he had encountered. To many Necron nobles, he is considered the avatar of nobility, a warrior who has given away all ties of rank and status just for the benefit of his people. To others, notably those who do not contribute to his cause, Andrakir is the worst kind of brigand, almost as bad a threat to the slumbering tomb worlds as the galaxy's other dangers. For his part, Anrakir would prefer to be supported willingly, but at the end of the day, need overrides all. His forces, worn down and ravaged by past campaigns, are always on the brink of collapse, and without reinforcements his great cause could come to an end. On the battlefield, Anrakir is accompanied by a cadre of Pyrian Eternals, the remnants of a vast immortal legion with which he began the great work. The ageless veterans are unswervingly loyal to their master, 
and murderously efficient in furthering his goal. But even their threat pales beside that of Anrakir himself. The same force of will that enables Anrakir to maintain command over his armies can be refocused temporarily to deceive enemy targeting systems, granting him control of the foe's weapons for a brief period of time. So it is that any foe who takes to the field against Anrakir would be well served to pay equal attention to the guns at the back in addition to those at the front. A few significant events he took part in include The Ruin of Morigar in 805 M41 When a battle between the Hive City gangs on the planet of Morigar inadvertently broke out, it awoke the Necron tomb hidden there. All contact with Morigar was lost afterwards. When the Cadian 207th Regiment makes planetfall six months later, there is no trace of any inhabitants, human or otherwise. Before the Imperial Guard can leave Morigar, the nomadic Necron warlord Anrakir the Traveler arrives as well. Assuming that the humans are responsible for the apparent destruction of the tomb world, he launches an attack that leaves his own forces decimated and the Cadian Regiment utterly destroyed. In 859 M41, Anrakir arrives in the embattled Lazar system, and immediately joins the forces of the Necrons defending against the onslaught of the Silver Skulls to start his chapter. Necron victory is finally assured at the Battle of Dreadpeak, when Anrakir's Pyrian Eternal spearhead an assault on the Silver Skulls' battle barge Argent Hammer. Although the Space Marines battle hard against the veterans of Pyria, their efforts are undone when Anrakir seizes control over the battle barge's still-functioning weapon batteries and turns their fury upon the defenders. It is probably worth noticing that the battle barge was downed already by this point. With the chapter master slain and their forces in disarray, the Silver Skulls are forced to withdraw their blockade of Lazar, although they take great care to ensure that word of their defeat does not spread. His duty done, Anrakir heads up into the galaxy once again. In 902 M41, we possibly have the very first encounter between the Necrons and the Tau Empire. A dozen Hive ships of the Hive fleet Gorgon assault the Tau colony of Kamaius, but then they are destroyed in turn as a fleet of Necron warships unexpectedly emerge from Kamaius' dead moon. Once the Tyranids are gone, Anrakir lands upon the planet and ironically is greeted by a great celebration from the local Tau. Uncaring of it, Anrakir orders the harvest of Kamaius, where most if not all the Tau population were killed or captured. Guess the enemy of my enemy is not my friend. At the end of the 41st millennium, Anrakir arrives on a planet he supposes to be the tomb world of Karnak only to find it infested with Eldar Exodites. Realizing that the tomb, if it still remains, will be buried too deep for him to awaken before the Exodites can summon aid themselves, Anrakir entreats the Necron Lords and Overlords of other tomb worlds for help. Reinforcements do arrive from Mandragora, Gidrim and Trakon, although the most unexpected of all is a contingent from Solemnus, led by none other than Trazen the Infinite. All of this does not happen overnight though, and by the time the Nightside fleets deploy their invasion force, the armies of the Alito craft world stand side by side with the Exodites. Guided by the prophecies of Farseer Eldor of Starbane and the strategies of Illic Nightspear, the Eldar attempt to stall the Necrons with a series of hit and run attacks. Their aim, to sever the command structure by destroying Anrakir himself and his allies. But the Pyrian Lord manages to subvert the prophecies of the Farseer via the astromantic analyses of Oricon the Diviner. Although the divinations of Oricon are by no means as focused as those of Starbane, they are enough to tangle the skies of fate and leave details beyond the reach of the Farseer. So it was that when Pathfinders arrived at what they thought to be Anrakir's location, they found only squads of Deathmarks waiting in ambush. After multiple inconclusive battles on Karnak's verdant plain, Anrakir forces the Eldar to engage in a head-to-head -head confrontation by marching on the World Spirit Shrine. As the Necron legions advance upon its walls, 
Doomsives dueled with Eldar fighters in the skies above. Deathmarks plied the deadly trade of ambush and counter-ambush with allied orc pathfinders. All the while, flayed ones prowled on the flanks, pouncing on any Eldar foolish enough to show any kind of weakness. The sides were still well matched, with the Necron hardiness countered by the precise strikes of the Eldar. Victory finally arrives on the Necron side, when the Doom world of Karnak unexpectedly began to waken. With Necron reinforcements now starting to trickle in constantly into the campaign, the Eldar have little choice but to abandon Karnak and the World Spirit Shrine to their foes. Andrakir is jubilant in the campaign's aftermath, and gladly accedes to the request of Traz and the Infinite that the World Spirit Shrine be granted to him. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about this unique Necron overlord, Andrakir the Traveler, for today. Definitely an unusual Necron leader, given that he is as close to selfless as any Necron can be, I guess. It's easy to see why some would see him as a hero and savior, since he does appear to place the greater good of his people above the regular petty bickering of Necron nobility. What about you, though? What are your thoughts about this guy? Is he among your favorite Necron characters? Personally, I do find his attitude refreshing and can definitely see myself even rooting for him. Do share your thoughts in the comments below if you want. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks for watching and the Emperor protects.